Thank you, Jenny and Caitlin, for that very lovely special music. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope all of you are doing well. Hope you enjoyed a, a wonderful night to be much observed last evening. We certainly did. We ate a lot, fellowshiped a lot, reminisced about God's way of life, and uh, talked about the differences between what we see around us today and, and what God's way of life is all about. But uh, good to see all of you here today. Welcome to our guests. We've got quite a few guests. I see a local elder that I'm looking peripherally at right now, uh, since I'm going to say something rude to him in just a second. I won't look him directly in the eye. But uh, we were in college together, Mr. Jim Chapman. And then also a few rows back is a fella I have not seen for 31 years. Uh, uh, Scott Cannon, uh, out, we were both, all three of us were in college together, so, uh, and, and the interesting thing is all three of us are kind of in the front part of the, the room, and I don't think that ever took place in college, so I, I don't know, that, that was my rude comment to, uh, to these guys, but uh, uh, good to see all of you here. It is great to be together with God's people, to, to be here to assemble before God on this holy convocation and, and to worship him as God commanded, as uh, Al was talking about in the offertory. Before we get into the sermon today, I, I do need to make one announcement, a very serious announcement for our Dallas brethren. Uh, I, I think some of you were aware of the situation of uh, Tony Carpenter's health. Uh, Tony Carpenter is the son of Wayne and Jane Carpenter, a deacon and deaconess in, in the congregation. Well, uh, a couple of days ago, he uh, took a turn uh, for the worse, a uh, variety of situations, and those of you who know that situation know that Tony has gone through quite a bit in his years, but uh, he was taken into the hospital and then placed in ICU and uh, subsequently began failing very, very rapidly and uh, was placed on life support. And as of this morning, Jane called me and said that uh, they had, had mentioned that his situation was such that, uh, that there was nothing going on. He was completely brain dead. So they were going to need, they, were, they had made the decision to take him off of life support, but they wanted to get all the family uh, in first. So, uh, of course, it's very difficult for, for Jane to, to share that uh, when she called uh, mid-morning mid around 11, 11.30. Uh, so they were wanting to get all the family in. Uh, all the family uh, who could get in did get in. They took him off of life support, and he died at 154 today. So uh, obviously a very, very difficult time for Wayne and Jane Carpenter, but I know uh, they know you love them, and they appreciate your prayers uh, for comfort for them and the family as they, as they deal with this loss. But uh, I know many of you will be reaching out to them here shortly as uh, plans and arrangements are made. But appreciate your prayers uh, for the family during this very difficult time. We live in a difficult time. We're flesh and blood. We're living in a, in a very difficult world. And yet we have so many blessings and, and so many wonderful things to be thankful for as we, as we face the challenges in our lives. And uh, here we are, here today on a feast day, a day of rejoicing before God to come before him and start uh, the beginning with this spring festival season as was kicked off with Passover and then the, the first day of unleavened bread kicking off last night with the moon shining brightly and we reminded ourselves of Israel leaving to that moon shining brightly and that pillar of fire as they left Egypt. And here we are doing this again as we've done so many, so many, many years, many of us. Some of us here have not been doing it for so long. But let's go through the reminders of what that time pictures for us as we keep these days now. I want to begin today by going to Amos 5. I think it's a good starting spot for us to address a concept that we'll be thinking about throughout the message today in these days of unleavened bread as they get kicked off. Amos 5 pretty much just sets it up kind of as it is, kind of as a Deuteronomy 30, uh, 19 principle. Uh, it, it's similar in, in that respect here as Amos is in the middle of his prophecy. We'll just break into the thought here as he's pleading with Israel, uh, lamenting for, for what is going to happen to Israel. But then at the, uh, near the end, well, actually near the, the middle of this, of this chapter, right before he gets into the events uh, surrounding the day of the Lord, again, pictured by our fall festival season, we see here in Amos 5, verse 14. Think about this with respect to why we're here now today. 
why we're here now today and we're getting ready and we are into the days of unleavened bread. Is this not what it's really all about with respect to these days? Seek good, seek good and not evil. Why? That you may live so the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you've spoken. Hate evil, hate it, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. We just finished Passover reminding us again of God's graciousness, of, of, of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and how much God loved us, how much Jesus Christ loved us, so that we can be in this state of being clean. As, as uh, Mr. Cobernot talked about in, in, the, in, the, in the sermonette, we are to then go forward and hate evil, hate evil and to love good. Uh, or, as we could say, woe to those, as Scripture talks about, who love evil and hate good. Do any of us here, do, do, does any of us have any element of where we love evil? We, we like a little bit of that evil? You can answer that. I can answer that in my life. You can answer that, young or old. Are there any aspects of evil that we love? Part of the meaning of, this day, uh, of these days is to say to God and to live before God that we hate evil. We hate it and we love good. I want to look at a three-step process that we, I, I think we think about. This is going to be a review for us, but it's a three-step process that we think about during this time that enables us, it serves as a, as a foundation point for us, to hate evil and to love good. God requires this of us annually to remind us of our Christian walk. Ask yourself today, are these three factors in place in my life? Are they or are they not? Am I, am I implementing certain aspects of these three aspects or am I taking on all three of those aspects in my life as I specifically think about that at the beginning of the Days of Unleavened Bread? Let's go to Exodus 12 to begin. Exodus 12 is the discussion that's taking place prior to the, uh, all that's, that was going to happen with the death of the firstborn. So uh, specifically Exodus 11 and 12 kind of lead up to that. And then we see later in Exodus 12 these events actually, actually happening. But let's go to Exodus 12 first. And, and we'll look at our first aspect of, of the three-step process that must be in place. If, if we are to hate evil and love good, uh, as, as typified by this unleavened bread season. Exodus 12, verse 11. We know this statement, but as they were eating of the Passover, as they were doing that, remember, I, I just try to envision what this is like of how they were to, to do this. And it, it, it expresses a very important concept with, with us in our lives as we uh, recognize the sin that is around us. Uh, Exodus 12, verse 11, And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist. What they're talking about there with the belt on your waist, it's, it's you're in your traveling clothes. You're, you're poised and ready to get out of Dodge. You're ready to leave. You're, you're there. You're ready. You've got your traveling clothes on. You've got your, uh, you know, sound of music. You know, they're having a big sound of music uh, re renewal thing here in... in uh, Let's see, it's in April. There's one showing or something that's supposed to happen all across the land. But remember when the Von Trapp family singers were going to go do their little sing and then get out of there and sneak out of the, out of the just at the end as they're being awarded the, uh, the, the top medal. I'm telling the whole story for those five-year-olds that haven't seen it. Sorry about that. But, but anyway, they had their traveling clothes. Remember, they had their certain clothes that were their traveling clothes. We are, we are, we are ready to roll. So we're, we're there. We're, we've got our belt on our waist. We've got our sandals on our feet, and our staff is in our hand, our walking staff, to head on out. Eat it in haste. Be ready. Eat it quickly. You're focused. It is the Lord's Passover. Why? Because you are leaving sin. You are leaving sin. We know this. This is very, very common uh, to, to our understanding of the Days of Unleavened Bread, but it is crucial. We must, number one, we must leave sin. We keep this every year to remind us that we must leave sin. We can't surround ourselves with the leavening. We can't surround ourselves with leaven without being drawn to it. If we surround ourselves by it, we're going to start nibbling on it. And sometimes we're going to chomp on it. 
So we've got to leave it. We've got to get out of it. We, we must leave it so we don't end up eating of it, feeding on it, because it will kill us. It will kill us dead. It will kill us dead spiritually. It, it, will, it will kill us dead as we see the, the, the effects of sin uh, that God's put in place uh, as we live our lives. It is deadly. Sin is deadly. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. When, you know, when the serpent addressed Eve... You know, here she was in the garden. We know the, the, the statement that's talked about in, in James 4 about submit to God, resist the devil, and, and the devil flees from you. Here, think of what had happened had, had Eve viewed this differently as if Adam had viewed this whole situation differently. When, when the serpent addressed her there at the beginning of, of chapter 3 in verse 1, she didn't resist him. She didn't leave him. Uh, she had the opportunity to leave him. She had the opportunity to resist him. As scripture says, he would have left her had she resisted him. But then we come to verse 6, Genesis 3, verse 6. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food. What's she doing around that tree in the first place? It's there in the garden. God says, you eat that, you are on the path to death. You are going to die. I do not lie. I am telling the truth. You will die. So what's she doing hanging around the thing? But she was over there. He was talking with her, and they were close to it. But she didn't leave it. She didn't get away from it. And it's such a basic concept in our lives. But that it is that process is that if we hang around that and stick around, the, the pull becomes greater and more powerful. So, so she's there, and you know, we know the story. It was pleasant to the eyes, and, and here I'm, I'm still looking at it then. It was a, a tree that was desirable to make one wise. Well, what, what's happening to cause that? She's obviously looking at it, thinking on it, listening to the serpent. So here she comes. She eats of its fruit and ate it, and of course, Adam does the same, and, and he ate. So it, it, they, they didn't leave it. They didn't get away from it. Remember all the different situations. You've got Noah. Get, you're, we're going to get out of that. You're going to get in the ark. You're going to leave that and get in the ark. I'm going to take care of you. Lot, I'm going to leave, get, get out of Sodom. I am going to protect you. Babylon, come out of her, my people. Don't, don't share in her sins. Get out. Leave. Uh, what are the leavening agents in our lives? We've been, we've been uh, hopefully leaving that behind, but, but what are they? Do we recognize our particular leavening agents that we specifically deal with that are our specific pulls, the lusts, the pulls, the desires that we choose not to leave? That we, we, we see elements of when we do, but we always feel that pull coming back. A key aspect of these days of unleavened bread is, is to pull back and look. You know, that whole thing of examining ourselves. The examination continues as we, as we recognize what are the spiritual areas that are deadly to me sinfully that I'm just not quite leaving like I need to. Recognize those. Hit them hard this week. Hit them hard with focus. As we, as we go about uh, our business uh, this week. You know, we grew up in a, a small little village. I, I, I've told you before, a little town of Sabina, population 3,500. Uh, it's probably increased somewhat, 15 or 20 maybe in the last 30 years. But uh, we, we grew up there, and I remember being a little bit frustrated in... Uh, in the second grade when my dad decided that we were going to move way out to the country which was uh, a mile and a half out of town, out of the thriving metropolis of Sabino, out, out into the, to the country, and we would be away from everybody. Actually, we, were in, we moved to a burg called uh, or, uh, Reeseville, and it, it, didn't have, it had a post office, but it didn't have any lights or anything. But uh, very, very small uh, little area, population 100, but it was kind of more like out in the country. And I was, I was frustrated at the time. I could walk to school there when I was in Sabina. It was about a mile from the school, and I had friends to play with. Uh, on the street, we'd play baseball, and a lot of baseball and football and all kinds of different uh, activities that we really enjoyed. And here I was, eight years old, pretty social, loved getting out and doing all these kinds of things with other people. And my dad just up and moves us out into the, the wilderness, out uh, to Reeseville. And I like, why did he do that? Uh, we, we ended up enjoying that and, and, and uh, enjoying the lifestyle out there. The house was not better than the other house. The other house was actually bigger. 
It's two stories. We had two bathrooms, and we went to one bathroom, and there ended up being five kids and, and two, two parents, uh, so that was a, a bit of a challenge, but, uh, but, but we, you know, so, so here we, we moved out of that, and, and my dad had, had made that move, he told me later, and I found out why. He, he felt like we as a family were beginning to be corrupted uh, by city life. Uh, so, so, you know, all these kids that we were around and this and that, he just sensed things that were going on that, that he just thought, this, this is not good for my family. I've got to, we've got to leave that for me to be able to do what we, we need to do. Now, obviously, as we've talked before, there's a difference between leaving sin and completely leaving the world to where, as we've talked, I'm going to go live out in the wilderness where there is nobody anywhere and I don't have to talk with anybody the rest of my life and therefore I will live righteously. And that doesn't work either. We are to be in the world but not of the world. But my dad recognized for the sake of the family we needed to, to make some changes and those changes could not take place in the family to strengthen our family if we continued where we were. So we left. We left, and it was a good thing. So as, as we reflect on, on this in our lives, are there, are there things in our lives that we are not leaving spiritually? If there are, address those. Address those. Go to God about those. Help me to leave them. Put a plan in place to leave them. Talk with those with whom you're close to, to work with them about uh, supporting you in, in helping you leave those things that must be left. The, the second area, let's go to Gen, uh, Exodus 12. Exodus 12. And this one is, is again, a, a, another, another simple concept, but such a, a beautiful concept in the way it is, it is tied to leaving, but it's not the same as leaving. And these are, these are both aspects of, of, of why we keep the Days of Unleavened Bread. Exodus 12. <clears throat> Exodus 12. We see here in verse 15. Let's, uh, let's look at verse 15. We'll just read the one verse here. He says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now, it, then he makes this next statement. And this is what, uh, upon what we're going to focus. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So on the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. Now, what's interesting about that with respect to society now? What, what's, what's interesting? Well, how many of you, uh, right as the, the days of unleavened bread began last night, just got your leavening and just, boom, it's out. And then, all right, let's go. Here we go. First day of unleavened bread. Let's make it happen. We're ready. Uh, it's just not that way now, is it? The, the situation was much different then. Okay, here they are. They're, they're, they're traveling. They've got their leaven products. They're, they're picking up tents and going. So they basically could just get the leavening, get the leavening agents, get them and put them out, and they're done, and they're ready for the Days of Unleavened Bread. We, we live in dwellings now, and we have, we have leavening. We have all of these different aspects of the different foods and, and different substances that are in all these different things that we've got to clean up. Then we've got the furniture, and we've got the couches and the, the chairs that we eat, those little miniature cinnamon donuts all year, uh, two per day, that, that are in that one chair, the little dribbles. And you feel them go uh, throughout the year, and you know they're going to... They're going they're going to have their day of reckoning. And so, so you know, this past week I had, to, I had to do that, and it took a while just to deal with my chair and then the, the, the couch and then the other chair. We've had guests since. We've got way more chairs in the living room than we would really like, but each one of those carries with its, its own level of cinnamon rolls of, 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 of flicks here and there. And so we're dealing with all that, and then we've got the vacuum cleaner. So you clean out the you, – you you've got to get the vacuum cleaner bag out. Hopefully you, you folks remember that, right? <laughs> But you've got to get the vacuum cleaner that has all of that and, and take the vacuum bag out. But you're cleaning right up until the last minute. So typically uh, what the Burnett household did uh, last night, we, we finished all of that and we got over to a family's home at around 6.30ish. So I've still got these. Well, actually, Christy found uh, some malted milk balls. And uh, if you have malted milk balls, those have leavening. So again, I'm just probably ruining several of your lives right now if you know that you're in that situation that you've got malted milk balls at home. But anyway, the malted milk balls that Christy had were leavened. So I was trying to just 
drive those down, uh, you know, uh, right before. So, again, you know, you know the, the analogy, get all the sin in that you can, you know, right before the days of unleavened bread kick off. But no, you know, you got you to gotta eat some of those tasty things. So anyway, so I'd taken care of that. So I had the malted milk ball. Uh, I couldn't eat all of them. There was, there was a large amount of them. So couldn't eat all of them. So I had the box there. But then we had, we had to get the vacuum cleaner bag out. So I smashed up the box and drove it down into the vacuum cleaner bag. Now, what are we going to do with the vacuum cleaner bag? Well, we thought, okay, we could put it out in the garbage can, but that's still in our household. I've got to I've got to remove it from my dwelling. So, well, we're going over to this family's house. Well, what are we going to do with the bag? So then I go get the Walmart bag. So you put the vacuum cleaner bag in the Walmart bag, tighten that thing down because, you know, the, the bags, you know, the dust kicks up, and then you're in the van that you deleavened last week, and then... So I had to get that tightened down, and then we're looking for a place. Where, where am I going to throw the, where am I going to get rid of the leavening? You know, which uncircumcised Philistine am I going to dump that trash can in? Kind of a, <laughs> So anyway, so we go through that whole process, and then sure enough, there's a Walgreens there off of Stacy. So you slide into the Walgreens. They have an outside trash can. Boom, put that right in there. I'm on my way. Uh, but it's just much more complicated now. It's much more complicated to remove the leavening from our homes. But it is a process. There is a difference between leaving sin and removing leavening. Uh, leaving Leaving is there, is there is sin all around us, and, and we, we leave that. We, we are to leave that. We are to see it and, and leave it. I get away from that as, uh, as tied to the passage that uh, Mr. Coburnot was reading in, in being the temple of the Holy Spirit. Just like he says, flee fornication because we, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Flee, get away from it, leave it. But also we have the removing aspect of, of what may be within, within us. Uh, that we have to remove and purge uh, from us. And then also the, the element in terms of thinking about the whole, uh, uh, that is, is that there could be situations where we are, as, as, it, as it says, we are to live in the world, but not be of the world. So we, we have to be around some of that. So we are, whatever it is, we try to remove that from us as we live in the world, which God tells us we, we have to do. So to what degree are we doing that? Leaving is, very diff- is a very different exercise than removing. Are we doing that? We, we, can, we, can, we can appear to have left something sinful and move forward, yet we have truly never removed it. Does that happen? That where we leave something, but, but we truly never removed it. It's been interesting over the years uh, seeing folks, uh, to some degree we, we can see it sometimes in our, our own lives, uh, where in, in relationships, say couples, friends, uh, work associates, uh, parent-child relationships, things can appear to be going smoothly or you'll be interacting with uh, folks in, in these various dynamic relationships. Things can be seeming to go on very, very smoothly, but then all of a sudden, boom, there's just this eruption and some, somebody upsets the other person and brrr, it's back and forth and it's, it's just, uh, just very volatile. And I think, well, where, where did that come from? It, it, it's there. It, it's there seething underneath the surface. You know, uh, on the surface, as, as we walk and we interact with folks, we, we th- may think, well, things are pretty smooth. But underneath, it's there, that, that, that deep-seated anger, that hurt, that, the, the rage that is just waiting to explode. Well, the, the, they, they have striven to have left it, but it, they never really removed it. It's still underneath. Is, is that the case in any of the relationships that we have with one another as God's people? Is that the relationship sometimes that's behind or just under the surface with those whom we love most that is, that is there? It's, 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 we, you know, we, we give the semblance that it is, it's, it's gone, but it's, it's there, it's ready. We have not truly removed it. I play uh, a sport. I've told you about this before, but I play this sport that I enjoy. I try to, I try to work out like two or three times a week. Sometimes it's fewer than that, but uh, I, I play this. It sounds like a girly man sport, but it's pickleball. It's a paddle sport with a little ball, and it's very, it's very fun, very active. Several here in the congregation uh, play that uh, uh, on, on Thursday nights with, with us up in, up in McKinney. But uh, it was interesting. I was in a situation recently where I was, I was playing this. It's a, they call it a ladder league where you, you 
uh, graduate up to certain levels based on wins and losses, but uh, you'll have one exercise where four of you switch partners playing this, this sport for about an hour. You play three separate games and you switch partners each time. And so I was playing with these, these, other, uh, these other three guys and I, and I know them, and not in the church, sorry, in case uh, you were thinking these are all church guys, but these guys are not in the church. And everybody gets along great. You know, we, we played hard. They were very good games, and, and, and it was going well. But then there was a point in the final game where the, the final pairing was set up that uh, a, a shot was hit. This guy hit this shot down the line, and uh, it was against me and another and, and my partner. But the, the partner, my partner, felt another ball from the court kind of rolled across and he felt like if that ball had not rolled across then he could claim if it then he could claim he could have gotten to that ball so uh, he claimed he said ball and and then the other guys on the other side well there was no way you were going to be able to get to that ball and frankly I would tend to have agreed with them but uh, legally in 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 the as he interpreted the the law of pickleball if if that makes <laughs> sense uh, anyway so he interpreted that he could he could have played that ball there was a remote possibility albeit a miracle that he could have gotten to that ball so he said no I I, I don't know if I could have gotten to the ball because that other ball came and I didn't even have the chance to go for it so therefore I want to replay and then they started, then the other guy said, that's what you always do. I was like, we were having a great time. That's what you always do. This is the way you always play. You do it every single time. I'm sick of it. What do you mean I'm doing this? And then all of a sudden, we're just playing a little pickleball game. And it's just, <laughs> it just erupts. And, and, and so what it is, it was this underlying seething anger that is there between individuals that has gone on for years that is just under the surface. And I think pickleball uh, teaches that, that very powerful lesson of, of do we really remove the leavening? We, we do that in our own relationships. Under the surface, there it is. It's there. And we've never really resolved that. We've never truly removed that. Uh, sometimes that can happen. I remember a story uh, of, a, of a, a ministerial training that uh, he was later a pastor but he, he told me how uh, there was, while he was training as a, as a ministerial trainee, he would ride with the family, the pastor and his wife. I don't, I don't think I've told you this, but he'd ride with them to services. And as he'd ride with them to services, as they'd run the circuit, you know, they'd go through the circuit, and then they're heading down to the other congregation. All of a sudden, they get in the car, and then it's just, rah, 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 rah. And, and so the pastor and his wife were just ripping each other back and forth, boom, 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 back and forth, and he's sitting back there, ministerial training, just kind of watching the kids, and they're spitting up and trying to take care of them and just trying to stay out of this. But then, like, they get about five minutes from the next service, and they'd say, okay, wait, 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 stop, 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 let's breathe. Now everything is okay, let's go in. And then they went in, and everything was okay. But it, underneath, the, the leavening had not been removed. It was there, and they never addressed it. They never truly addressed it. it. It continued to be there. 1 Corinthians 3, let's pick up where Mr. Cobernot left off. 1 Corinthians 3 brings out an important passage with res respect to this. These are, I think, lead-up verses. Well, no, no thing about I think. They, they are. They are lead-up passage, passages to the very familiar statement that we read in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, which we will which we will cover here shortly. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 5, verses 7 and 8. Take a quick glance at that, and you, of course, that's something that we will definitely cover here in just a little bit. But let's look at the, the lead-up factor with respect of point number two. Remove the leavening so we don't eat leavening. We can leave it, but, but, it, but it's, it's still, it still can be there. We can think we're leaving it, but it can still be there. And if we don't remove it, we, we will end up eating it. First, first Corinthians 3, now verse 18. I think Chris finished it about verse 17. First Corinthians 3, verse 18, he says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise, you think you're wise in this age? Let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world, when we look at that in perspective, the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. It's, it's written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They're futile. Verse 21, therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. 
whether Paul or Apollos, Cephas, Peter, uh, or, or the world or life or death, or, or things present or things to come, all are yours, all ultimately will come to us. We are joint heirs with Christ in terms of the, the incredible promises that await us. And you are Christ's. We, we, we are owned by Christ, and Christ is God's. God you know, owns Christ in that respect. They, they, you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. It's all yours. So he says, now let's go to chapter chapter 4, verse 6. Chapter 4, verse 6, leading, leading up to it, we, we get into this... This, this thing of not removing something that we see tied to later with 1 Corinthians 5, and it's the, the aspect of pride. Uh, God says that the pride is of no value. It's of no practical value. It's very, very detrimental to us. You know, prior to getting to verse 6, we see in verse 5, he says, uh, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. God, uh, God Christ is the one who will will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. When, when a person is filled with pride, he's not looking for the praise of God. A person filled with pride is filled with leavening to the degree that each of us allows a little bit of pride to come in is, is, is the degree to which each of us allows a little bit of leaven to leaven the whole lump. We've got to remove it. We've got to remove pride. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I figuratively transferred uh, to myself and Apollos for your sakes, uh, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up, that none of you may become arrogant on behalf of, of one against the other. That, that's not what it's about. For who makes you differ from another? And, and what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why then do you boast as if you had not received it? You're already full. You know, he said, think about it from the perspective of, of our calling and, and what we've been given. Uh, especially now as we reflect upon the, the days and the meaning of these days and the meaning of Passover as we've kept it. God's people recognize this. God's people are humble. We recognize that we're full as a result of this. You're already rich. You've reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might be reigning with you. Verse 9, for I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we've been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We're fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, he's talking about their, their present state. We, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly clothed. We're beaten. We're homeless. We labor. We're working with our own hands. We're, we're being reviled, but in, in doing so, we bless uh, and as we're persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We've, made, uh, we've been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things unto now. So he, he says all that, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll continue here all the way up to verse 2 of chapter 5. He says, I don't write these things to shame you, but as he was telling the brethren there at Corinth, as we are to take warning from this as well, he says, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you don't, you don't have many fathers, for, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul was the one who uh, had been responsible for that through Christ. He says, so therefore I urge you, imitate me. So was Paul trying to get them all to focus on him as, as, as being the end all? Well, he wanted them to, to look at his example because he, in a sense, was like a father to them in in. Uh, helping their, their education and teaching them in God's way of life. But ultimately, he ties that back to the, the true essence here in verse 17. Verse 17, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ. That, that's where it gets back to. We are, we, as we remove sin, we are looking to the example of Jesus Christ. We, we just covered that at Passover, that reminder of, of the, the life that this individual led, the way that he did not revile when he was reviled, the way that he lived perfectly. We, he is the model. As we do that, we don't, get, we don't get filled with pride, do we? We see Christ as the ultimate example of which we fall short. 
So he says, verse 18, now some are puffed up as if I'm not coming to you. He says, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I, and I will know that not the word of those who are puffed up, but, but the power. It's not, it's not about them, it's the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? So he's, he's asking them, pleading with them to, to, again, take on a humble approach. Uh, and, and by doing so, we remove ourselves from pride. So it is a pridefulness that's not being removed. Look in verse 1 of chapter 5. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Then a man has his father's wife. And then he says, again, because it, the, the situation was not removed, he says, you are puffed up, you are arrogant about this, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. For some reason, they weren't, getting, they weren't taking care of business as they ought. And what was that reason? Pride was underneath. Pride was underneath. They had not removed pride, so they didn't recognize the nature of it. Uh, so... You've got to remove the leavening, and we've got to leave it, we've got to remove it, and we can't eat of it. Uh, what eating leavening during this time pictures is, is, is in part pride, being puffed up uh, about it, yet, yet nothing present on the inside. I don't know how many of you have seen the, the Gods Must Be Crazy uh, movies. I remember being a junior at uh, Am Ambassador College taking international relations. And Mr. Hogberg, the instructor who is here today, took us to God. The Gods Must Be Crazy. It was the strangest movie I had ever seen. But, uh, but, but, uh, but it, was, it was fascinating. Uh, and, and to some degree, it, it just it demonstrated the, the different views that people have on what is important in life. Uh, and, and you see a lot of that pride coming out. But I, but I want to talk about The Gods Must Be Crazy too. Just a little trivia. How many of you have seen The Gods Must Be Crazy 2? Okay, a few weirdos out there among us. But uh, anyway, there's this one part in The Gods Must Be Crazy. It, it deals with this tribe, that, uh, a remote tribe out in the desert, and what, what they go through in life as they interact with society. But there's one point where uh, a boy and his younger brother, I believe, I'm trying to remember the details of this, but a, a boy and his younger brother get separated from the group, and they're trying to make their way back to their family. And, and they're, they're stalked by uh, some type of animal. I can't remember if it was a hyena or, or a leopard or some, something was stalking them. But they realized that uh, the boy had been taught that the bigger that they looked, the more ferocious they looked. And as a result, the stalker, the, the predator, would, would, would not attack. So he realized that if he put his little brother up on his shoulders, all of a sudden, you know, seven feet two or whatever. So he, he all, they, they all of a sudden made themselves bigger and, and it lurked in the background, but it never attacked because they were so big. Well, they were very tiny. They were easy prey, but they, they faked out the predator. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen, you know, I've seen some documentaries in India about, you know, they have the situation with tigers. Uh, have you seen where they, they put the, the face on the back of their heads? So it's, it's like, as they say, the tigers will attack from behind. So they put this big placard up in the back that's this giant head just looking around as they're walking. It's very strange watching that uh, on a documentary, and I realized what it was. Uh, so it was, it was to, to think, fake out the tiger that they're actually looking, and it's, it's just the back, it's, uh, back of its head. So, and then the other thing is we see animals that, uh, that puff up, big fish, little fish that puff up to, to seem bigger to uh, scare the prey. Predators can be deceived. Prey can be deceived. People can be deceived. But God cannot be deceived. God is not deceived pridefulness puffs up to give the impression of something that's not there. It is a leavening agent, and God recognizes it for what it is. At some point, pride, unrestrained, not kicked and, and removed, will allow a person to puff himself or herself up. It will allow that person to get to that point to where he or she can actually tolerate sin. They, they tolerate it, and they don't remove it. And, and as 
Paul was bringing out here. He was saying, this is what's happening. This is what's happening here in Corinth. Pride leads a person to say, you know what? Sin is okay for me. I can handle it. I've got a strong stomach. My stomach's got a strong constitution. It can take it. King Solomon's stomach was not strong enough. King Uzziah's stomach was not strong enough. King Saul's stomach was not strong enough. King Asa's stomach was not strong enough. Ananias and Sapphira's stomachs were not strong enough. And the list goes on. Uh, Our stomachs are not strong enough to handle taking in pride, to eating that leavening. 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5. The list goes on and on of examples in the Bible where pride gets in there. It's a very key area of removing sin, of removing that from our lives. Because the opposite of pride, of course, is humility. Humility of which Christ set the ultimate example of being a humble person. First Peter 5, although he was all-powerful, he was the ultimate in humility. First Peter 5, verse 5, we know this passage. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Clothed inside and out, as, as 1 Peter 3 talks about, the, the don't let your adornment be merely outward, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. The heart is clothed with humility. The hidden essence of who we are is completely clothed with humility. Be submissive to, to one another because God resists the proud. He hates that leavening. He hates every aspect of it because God hates evil and he loves good. God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12 and and look at the passage where Paul discusses this, this experience that he had of being caught up to the third heaven and seeing things that man has not seen. Um, so he goes through and, and discusses that, uh, of that experience, partly to, to help the, the brethren of Corinth realize, um, I, I, am, uh, I have been assigned or appointed by God to serve you, and I take that very seriously. Paul is saying, and and the authority that I have, I've been given by Jesus Christ to do this. And I I want you to know that I have had some experiences in my life. So he goes through and talks about that to where a person just reading that from just straight up, not understanding any of the background of what what Paul was dealing with in Corinth might think, well, is this guy bragging a little bit here? He he was not bragging at all. And and in talking about this experience that he saw and, and, and what Uh, he envisioned throughout this he says in verse 7 and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations that that, again he had seen he said a thorn in the flesh was given me a message a message of Satan to a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure I mean that can that can happen it can happen to any of us it can happen to us as we see God blessing our lives and, and helping us in a variety of ways we can we can move into a state of exalting ourselves above measure and let leavening in the leaven of pride concerning this thing he said I pleaded with the Lord three times that I that it might depart from me and he said to me no my grace is sufficient for you For my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. How many of us have experienced that, where we've seen that happen? And and the peace that we get through the afflictions that we've experienced. Therefore, uh, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. Take pleasure in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. 
So 1 Corinthians 5, as we, we finish up that point of point 2, 1 Corinthians 5, he then, so he, it's all getting to this aspect of the, the leavening that has not been removed the leaven of pride and what it resulted in to tolerate sin uh, in their lives there and and as a congregation to tolerate that. So he says, back to 1 Corinthians 5 verse 3 in, uh, let's go to verse 4. He says, so in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, this individual that's doing what he's doing, he says, deliver such a one to Satan. Put that person out for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus and of course we see in 2 Corinthians that that was what took place as this person later repented and Paul said bring him back in that person has demonstrated repentance bring him back in lest lest it be too great for that person to bear but at that time as that person was living in sin and and pridefully doing so and others being caught up by that little leaven that leavens the whole lump He said, get rid of it, remove it. Your glorying, verse 6, is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? It just takes a little bit. Not dealt with, not removed, not put in the garbage can at Walgreens. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to get it out. We've got to get it out and, and keep it out. That you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. As Christ has done that for us. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So let's go to our third point. So we've got to leave it. We've got to remove it. And then as we know, we've got to eat the good stuff. We've got to eat the unleavened bread. Have you eaten unleavened bread so far today? Did you start last night? We are to eat unleavened bread this week. Exodus 13, verse 6. Exodus 13, verse 6 tells us this. We go through these physical things to help us remember what we're doing spiritually. Exodus 13, verse 6. He says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Starts it and also finishes it with with, uh, a high day. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall be uh, leaven be seen in, among you in your quarters. And verse 8, Exodus 13, verse 8 now. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. God, God removed me from that. So we're going to eat unleavened bread to remind us that, that we are unleavened. God God helps us understand through 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. It helps us understand what we are to be doing. We are to eat in of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We know that as we eat of the Passover, that unleavened bread, we are in a sense eating of Christ. We are taking in of Christ. We are part of that that body, the church. We are representing to him our connection to that body by taking in of him. Unleavened bread during the days of unleavened bread pictures eating in of what is good, filling up with the good stuff uh, of, of sincerity and truth. Let's go to John 6. We'll read a memory scripture that we had back in college. I remember my sophomore year, we got that one that we had to memorize. You know, you think about the kings of Israel. What, what was their requirement? What did they have to do? Write a copy of the law. You, I, when, when you are made king, Sit down and write a copy of the law. Why would, they, why would God do that? You know, the king is busy. He's got so much going on. You know, I, I'm busy. I'm running a nation. I say if people need to jump, I tell them to jump and they jump. If, if this person needs to die, I say this guy dies, this guy stays alive. And you know what? That's what happens. I'm a very busy individual. I'm running the show. I say whether there's life or death. I say whether we, are, we go, to, go to war as a nation or not. Everybody honors me, and they deal with the consequences that I mete out if they don't. And yet God says, I want the king to take the time to write down a copy of the law. You mean to tell me I'm supposed to sit down and scrupulously write out the law, word by word, letter by letter, with all that I have going on? Yes, so they don't eat the leavening of pride. And point three, so that they eat 
the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. God's word is, is filled with that. As John 6, 663 says, it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. We are to, to eat of God's word, to take in of God's word. Christ's words are, are spiritual. Christ was the word. God did all things through Christ. We are to, to eat of that. Are we eating unleavened bread spiritually? Are you eating unleavened bread spiritually every day? Are you reading God's word every day? Am I doing that? Am I doing that every day? Am I feeding on that? Am I, am, do, am I hungry for it? It is our sustenance for life. If we're not eating, start eating. Start eating every day. Eat of that unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Truth. What does a hunger strike provide for us? You know, are, are any of us here on a hunger strike right now? You know, I've decided I'm not going to read the Bible. I, I may read it, you know, every now and then. And then when I do, I, 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 I read a good bit, you know, so I can get some good eating out of it. No, we, we have to eat it regularly. A hunger strike only proves that we are unteachable, that we are stiff-necked, that we are foolish, that we are rebellious, that we are prideful, and that we're hard-hearted like those who left Egypt. Uh, we must eat. We must feed. It's, it's like uh, one of my favorite TV shows, you know, it's like... You know, when you, you think of Aunt B and she's, she's, she's there and she's saying, Opie, Andy, time for supper. You know, they, they run down. They, they come down very quickly. The only thing they steer away from, of course, uh, are uh, Aunt B's uh, homemade pickles that everybody else uh, steers away from. But they, they knew that it was time to eat and they came down and they enjoyed her meals. They fed and, and looked forward to eating that meal, that, that daily meal uh, that, that Aunt B uh, prepared for them. Uh, how do we come to the dinner table spiritually? How do we eat unleavened bread this week? Yes, we physically eat it, and we, and we should be diligent about eating unleavened bread this week. But we, how do we do it spiritually? We, we study God's Word. We think about God's Word. We, we let it flow into us and think on it. And, and we truly also think on Christ. We think about who Christ was. As Paul said, imitate me. And then he said, as, as Christ lived, it's, it's all in Christ. We're to take time thinking on the life that Christ lived, how he lived his life, uh, how he approached things and, and, and all of that. And then the other thing about feeding, the other thing about feeding that God requires of us we are here today because this is a holy con convocation. Uh, we are, as a congregation, holy to God. He makes us holy as well. But, but we, we cannot, we are not eating if we do not come before God on a regular basis. Every Sabbath, we, we are to be here every Sabbath. It is God's way of, of feeding us. And, and it comes through the, the, the preaching, the foolishness of preaching that happens as, as Paul talks about it. But it also comes through fellowship. And, and some people get in their minds that, you know, I, if I hit the Christmas Easter days, you know, if I, hit, if I hit the feast and I hit the spring holy days, then, man, I'm good. I'm good. I get to Passover. Got that. I'm good. And then I'll kind of maybe get to some of the other things. It's not the way it works. It's not like we, we starve ourselves for six weeks and then I'll go, go once here and then I'll, I'll get a good meal and I'll be okay. Uh, no, it, it doesn't work that way. Every Sabbath is a holy convocation. We have to come and feed. We are human. And, and there, there is the element that's not just the foolishness of preaching, but there's the element of fellowship. It is critical to Christian growth. And it's challenging at times. It's challenging. We're all from different backgrounds, but we, we have to come and fellowship. God says it is, it is a part of what causes Christian growth to occur. It's part of what causes, it, it is part of eating. Uh, it is part of that feeding in of the unleavened bread as we interact with one another. We are, we, God created us to be social creatures. The church is a body, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10 this past Passover. We, we, we keep that and we remind that we are all one body. We are all part of Christ. If we're not interacting together, if we're not coming together on a weekly basis, we, we aren't eating. We aren't eating. We're starving. And the thing is, is we don't know it. 
We, if we get into that mode, we don't know it. And now, now, granted, of course, I understand there are many situations that, that complicate a person being able to be at services. Health conditions, sometimes travel situations, those things are, are, are challenging. And I know people, there are people who are very, very diligent, who are doing the best that they can in difficult cir circumstances. And we are happy uh, that, that that is possible. And we want to provide that. But there are those as well who don't come, who know they should be here. And don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. If it is within your power to be here, be here because we need it. God set that in place for us. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, go to uh, one other passage today to, to kind of, uh, actually two other passages to, to wrap things up. Uh, let's go to Revelation 3. For, for, for God to dwell in us as as, as Mr. Kobernot was talking about, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are the temple of the Spirit. For God to dwell in us, we've got to be eating of him. We've got to be eating of his way. We've got to welcome him in. We do that by feeding on his word. We do that by being here as a body, uh, worshiping together. We do that as we fellowship together. That is necessary. <laughs> there is no other way that God's put in place for that to grow. Don't deceive, let's don't deceive ourselves into thinking something otherwise uh, because it, it, there is no otherwise. We've got to be here. Uh, Revelation 3, verse 17, we know this passage as it talks about uh, uh, Laodicea, and I, I always, as I read this, I think, okay, to what degree is this of me? To what degree do I need to see? Andy, you're sliding, you're slipping into this mode. Revelation 3, verse 17, because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, you, we don't know that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. When you read Paul's writings, in different places, he talks about his state and his condition, and he comes and and in some situations he sees himself in that way. Yet at the same time, he sees how God, not not within Paul's own power or pride, but God is the one who fills him and and makes him spiritually rich and and in a sense spiritually wealthy. And and to where Paul says, I I. Uh, have need of nothing. I found in whatsoever state I am there with to be content. Paul had gone through that process to see that that all comes from God. But the, the Laodicean approach is I've got it. I've, I've got it. I've got it covered. I'm there. But I don't realize how starved I am. Uh, that I, I think is, is one of the key elements of the message to the Laodiceans church. They're starving to death and they don't know it. Where are we in that respect? I, I, I just ask all of us, uh, and I ask Andy Burnett as well, to take a renewed effort at feeding, eating the good stuff. We demonstrate the, to God that we love good and hate evil as we feed on spiritually enriching food. What food and drink do you keep in your spiritual pantry, fridge, and freezer? What are, what, what's there? What are you chomping on? Uh, spiritually destructive food uh, we can take into our lives uh, and destroy us, uh, very poisonous. Hence the do not eat anything leavened during this time. Finally, let's go to Psalm 81. We are to eat what is good for us spiritually. Uh, I, I will say this, all analogies break down. I don't know if you heard this newscast uh, example of that. Here recently, it was a Fort Worth newspaper. I, I, uh, my wife had seen something on the TV about it, and I looked it up online. But there's a lady who, uh, her name's Elizabeth Sullivan. She just celebrated her 104th birthday, uh, lives in Fort Worth. And they, they had asked her, they interviewed her, and they, they asked her, okay, so what, what's, what do you say is the reason for your, your longevity? And she said, well, I've, I've always kept in close contact with the doctor. Dr. Pepper, and and they said what? Uh, she said, well, back in you know when I was in my 60s, I discovered Dr. Pepper, and it was so good. I loved the flavor of it, so I decided from that point forward to drink three Dr. Peppers a day. And uh, the, she said I would go to my doctors, and uh, the doctors would keep saying, 
you know, Elizabeth, you, you drink this stuff, it's going to kill you. And she said, my doctors just keep dying one after the other, and I, I keep on cranking. So, you know, all, all analogies break down at some point, but uh, I know there are some in here who enjoy Dr. Pepper, hopefully in moderation. But uh, we, we want to eat what is good for us. We want to eat what is good and drink what is good for us uh, spiritually. Uh, one of my... Uh, one of these psalms that I just read, read here recently and reviewed, I thought this is a, a beautiful passage to kind of conclude things today as we reflect upon uh, these, these upcoming days uh, with respect to uh, the, this holy day season in which we find ourselves. Uh, psalm, psalm 81, verse 1. Sing aloud to God our strength. God is our strength. Paul, uh, Paul recognized where his strength uh, originated sing aloud to God our strength make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob raise a song and, and strike the timbrel the pleasant harp with the lute blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon at this full moon on our solemn feast day a reference most probably to the feast of trumpets uh, for this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony. When he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. Verse 6, I removed his shoulder from the burden. His baskets were freed from the baskets. As we reflect on how they came out of sin and how God uh, removed us from that. He, he says, uh, you called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah, as we are tested. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you listen to me, if you will listen to me, there shall be no foreign God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then notice what it says. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Is, are our mouths open wide to God? And, and are we letting him fill us this week with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth? But he says, you know, my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. You know, we open our mouths by listening and walking and in preparing ourselves for eating by God, uh, eating uh, the food that God's prepared for us. And verse, verses 15 and 16 show us that in doing so, we feed on the richest of spiritual foods. The, the healthy Dr. Pepper, if I could say that. You know, the, 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 the richest of spiritual foods we, can, we take in. God, God is such a wonderful God that as, as Mr. Garrett was talking about, his gifts are free that he gives us. And he wants to give them to us, but we've got we've to we've come to supper. We've got to come to supper when Aunt B calls. God's food is the only thing that sustains me, the opposite of pride. So this week, remove the leavening. Hopefully we've done this, and we'll do so spiritually this week. Don't eat leavened products. Think about your situation all this week. Uh, for those of us that are in the work world and out and, and sometimes eating at restaurants, think about that. Every time we go to eat food, I, I've got to keep the leaven products out. I can't take any in, and, and I've got to be on guard for that. But spiritually speaking, don't eat any leavening this week. Eat unleavened bread. The title of the message is leave it, remove it, don't eat it, and eat. Eat. Eat unleavened bread this week. Let's eat it regularly throughout the week. Think as we eat so we can think about these spiritual principles and thus allow the and thus follow the spiritual principle of taking in what is sincere, right, and truthful, the good things of God. As we do that, brethren, we will gain strength from God by it. I need God's strength. I don't have it of my own. We all, we all need God's strength. And, and as we demonstrate to him how we love God, uh, love God, love good, and hate evil. God will bless us abundantly. May these days be very, very fruitful.